Uh, please take a copy of the Holy Scriptures. There is copies at the back. And turn with me to the book of Exodus. Uh, working our way through Exodus. We've slowed down as we've come to Exodus 20. And we're now looking at the Ten Commandments, commandment by commandment. Would you pray with me before we read God's Word? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Almighty God, before us is your holy and inerrant Word. Would you please send your Holy Spirit that we might understand, believe, obey it. Show us as we read your law, our sin and our need. And show us as we read your law, how Jesus embodies the holiness that is described in your law and has perfectly obeyed it for us. And show us as we cling to the Lord Jesus who obeyed the law, that all the grace we need to begin to live in obedience to it is available to us in Christ. And give to us a renewed resolve to live for your honour and your glory, with lives conforming increasingly to the pattern of your law. Do this for the praise of the name of Jesus, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. This is the word of God, Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of your, the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days... The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbour's. We thank the Lord for his holy and inerrant word. Today we're thinking about the fourth commandment, and uh, the Sabbath commandment teaches and reminds us that God is Lord of our lives, and his lordship claims the prerogatives of ordering our days in the way that he has arranged the week. The Lord God, as it were, is planting the flag of his sovereignty in our lives and claiming dominion over our days. He is the Lord of time. But the truth is that the fourth commandment is probably the most controversial of the ten and the most widely dissented from. Because we tend to operate on the basis that our times are our own. But the Sabbath makes the point in a very deliberate, practical, functional way that all time, every moment, belongs to God. God regulates our week and insists that we pay full respect to this basic idea that God is in charge and we are not. And keeping the Sabbath and the Sabbath requirement insist upon that point. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Lord of my life. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. And the Sabbath commandment is a way to express that fundamental commitment. When we set aside the Lord's day for rest and for worship, we are saying that the Lord is in charge and he orders my day. 
the various ways to come at the teaching of the fourth commandment. And I went back and forth. I rewrote, I rewrote, I rewrote. I, I started by looking at the Old Testament, the New Testament, continuity, discontinuity. And uh, I thought that was, that was a great way to look at it. And then I thought I'd just work, work my way through verses 8 to 11. But one of the beauties about the fourth commandment, which I could, kept coming back to, was that the way that the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, connects to the biblical storyline as a whole, through creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. The biblical storyline. So I want to consider the fourth commandment under those parts, those four parts. Because the fourth commandment speaks to us not just about a day of rest and of worship, but about our lives of labour and work, our vocations and avocations. The fourth commandment is teaching us not just about a day that's set apart for the praise of God and the rest of our minds, bodies and souls, but about devotion and duty, about rest and business, about work and worship. It, the fourth commandment speaks to the whole trajectory of our lives. So our little stories are being placed in the context of the big story of creation, fall, redemption, new creation. So we're going to think about work and rest in light of creation, fall, redemption, new creation. And then I'll give you three simple, practical ways that I hope will help you keep the fourth commandment, and then we'll be done. But first of all, work and rest in light of creation. As we saw from the reading of verse 11, the fourth commandment takes us back to Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2, and to the pattern of God in creation, work and rest on the seventh day. That was the pattern of God's activity at the dawn of history. And it forms the basis of the pattern of our week. So we're to work six days and rest one day in seven. Because that is the pattern of God himself. Work and rest. In Genesis 1, when we read of Adam, who was made in the image of God, we are immediately told that Adam was given work to do. Genesis 1, 28, And God blessed them before the fall, and God said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every little living thing that moves on the earth. So Adam was given work to do. So the verbs that are used there to fill the earth and subdue it can also be translated to tend the earth and to guard it. And they were the same verbs that were given to the Levitical priests in the temple, their sacred work. So the work that was given to Adam was sacred. There is a dignity to it that brought honour and glory to God. And as Adam engaged in his work, he displayed his character as the image bearer of God. Human work is not a necessary evil to be endured to get to the leisure time for which we are living. I tell my boys that all the time. It's not that you... Your human work is not just a necessary evil so you can get to that leisure time. Now, human work is a way for creatures to display the image of God, vested in dignity and sacred value. But God himself built into our lives the cycle of one day in seven for worship and rest. One day in seven. Because we were built not just to exist horizontally, working in the world that God has made, but we're built to exist vertically, worshipping the God who made it all. Sometimes people will argue, and this is the continuity, discontinuity debate, that the Sabbath principle belongs only to Mo Moses. It's a mosaic principle, and it pertains and belongs only to the law of Moses and does not bind all people, and does not continue in its re relevance and force today, now that Jesus has come. 
But Moses makes it plain that the Sabbath didn't find its roots at Sinai. It wasn't at the giving of the law, but at creation. The Sabbath has its roots in creation, not in the giving of the law. It is a creation ordinance. It is a creation design. It is enshrined in the moral law of God. The same law that was written on Adam's conscience in the garden as an abiding principle that's obligatory upon us as the other commandments are. It is required of us, like giving God and honour and glory and worshipping no other God but him, honouring our mothers and fathers, and as necessary as the prohibitions against adultery and murder. Because the Sabbath is of a piece with the whole of God's moral law and is rooted in the pattern that God himself created at creation. The Sabbath principle didn't start with Moses, it started with creation. In the fourth commandment, we go back to creation, to the Garden of Eden. And the Sabbath was the first commandment given to Israel as a nation after they crossed the Red Sea. Leviticus 23, verse 3, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest, the holy convocation. You shall do no work, it is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So early on, we see those twin engines of work and rest. We rest so we can be free to worship God and we give God worship by trusting him enough to rest. In Exodus 31, the last command given before Moses comes down from the mountain is the commandment of the Sabbath. So it's the first one as a nation before the Ten Commandments And it is at the end of Exodus 31, before he comes down the mountain and sees the golden calf. Signifying once again that this Sabbath principle was a sign of the covenant under the Mosaic dispensation. The Sabbath was not just a creation ordinance for all humanity, but it was a sign of the covenant between God and his chosen people. That's why the prophets would denounce Israel for doing business as usual on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the day for rest and worship. One day in seven. The Sabbath cannot just be done away with because we might want it to be done. Work and rest in light of creation tells us that work is sacred and marked by dignity that is ours as we are image bearers of God and tells us that Sabbath rest is part of God's design for us, that we might honour him in every age. So work and rest in light of creation. Secondly, work and rest in light of the fall. The way God made it is not the way things continue to be. Adam, who was placed in the garden to obey God, the first Adam, did not obey God. He sinned and fell by eating the forbidden fruit. And the covenant that was made with Adam fell with him on that first transgression. So Adam's guilt is ours, Adam's sin is ours, and the consequences of Adam's rebellion touches us all. It touches the world that we live in. So Genesis 3, verse 17 and following, God pronounced the curse on Adam's rebellion. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and the thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. In other words, while we're still called to work and serve God in fulfilling the vocations he gives us, in his providence as image bearers of the creator. Now that sin has broken the world, then it's an immensely more complicated, burdensome and challenging reality. We have jobs that constantly remind us that the world is broken. We have jobs that demand of us more than we can give. We come home weary, tired, Stressed, burdened. Does that describe anyone here? 
We live in Genesis 3.17 most of the time. We feel the truth of it in our bodies, in our tired minds. When your back aches from sitting too long at your desk. When your eyes are filled with sand because you've been staring at that screen for too long. When you're buckling under the stress of an employer's expectation or a colleague's demands. When there's a conflict between your family's needs and the obligations of your work. You ever felt that stress? When making ends meet requires more work than you have energy. Remember Genesis 3.17. When work is only thorns and thistles and sweat, it is a reminder that this is not the way things were meant to be and we were made for another world. So it's into that context that Exodus 28-11 speaks. In a fallen world, in a world of sin, where work is either avoided in laziness or made an idol of in greed, where we either work too little or we work too much. And into that, into that context, God says, rest one day in seven. The Sabbath is a gift. It's a gift. The Sabbath is a gift of extraordinarily divine mercy. It is a gift of grace that God would give us one day out of seven and say, because he knows our frame and remembers that we are but dust, we need to stop. You need to be still and know that God is God. You need to rest. You need to have enough trust to close the textbooks. You need to have enough trust to put down the pen, if you ever use one of those anymore. You need enough trust to stay away from the office. You need to trust God enough to say no to the overtime. You need to trust God enough to give your tired minds and weary bodies rest and respite and give souls spiritual nourishment. You need to trust God enough for that. Because we are in an always-on, 24-7 digital age like no other age before. I was speaking to somebody this week, and if somebody hasn't replied to you by email or WhatsApp within two hours, then there's a problem. Just make a... Just, 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 don't, just, don't, just don't play the game. Don't, don't, don't be rude, but don't play the game. Squawking, bleeping... I was... You know, I, I was... Even on an aeroplane, beep, beep, boom, 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 boom. It's just like there's, you know, there's an orchestra going with electronic noises. Be quiet. Rest. Worship. Keep the Sabbath holy. That is a profoundly countercultural act in 2023. But is a deeply nourishing and life-giving act which we all desperately need. There is an ample, there's ample evidence that our relationship to work is out of whack because our society, our world, is a world, is a world that pegs status to overachievement. We admire workaholics. Have you ever heard, you know, what's your biggest fault? Yeah, I work too hard. I mean, it's like, yeah, we put up there as, workaho you, as if you're a workaholic. You're a hero. At least you're not a lazy good for nothing. You're a hero because you're a workaholic. Really? We need a Sabbath rest. We need a Sabbath rest. The Sabbath rest is a gift of grace. And we do ourselves, our bodies and our souls damage by neglecting the Sabbath. Third, work and rest in light of redemption. Work and rest in light of creation. Work and rest in light of the fall. Work and rest in light of redemption. The, the version of the fourth commandment in Deuteronomy 5 verse 15 grounds the reason for keeping the fourth commandment not in creation but in salvation. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. 
And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, therefore, becomes a commemoration and a sign of the saving grace of God. That there is rest from the slavery from which he has saved his people. Now we know that slavery is but a type of deeper slavery. The slavery of sin and the redemption from Egyptian bondage is a picture of the far greater redemption that has been won for us by Jesus Christ. So the Sabbath is a gospel day. The Sabbath is a day that tells us of our deliverance from sin and death and hell by the work of another on whom we rest. The Lord Jesus Christ, who obeyed and bled, he died and rose for those who believe. That's the ultimate meaning of the Sabbath. It points us to the gospel. The Sabbath points us to Christ. It calls us not only to rest our limbs and our minds, but rest our souls, our destinies, on the Lord Jesus Christ who saved us by his grace. It is a gospel day, which is why the day has changed from the seventh to the first. And now the work of redemption has been accomplished in its fullest by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that stone is rolled away and life and immortality is brought to light by the resurrection of the Son of God, we gather together on Resurrection Day. We gather together on the first day of the week, Resurrection Day, the Lord's Day. In the opening chapter of Genesis, God said, let there be light on the first day of the week and creation began. And in the middle of history, as it were, Jesus Christ, the light of the world on the first day of the week, triumphed. He rose from the grave. He shattered the darkness and ushered in the new creation. It was on the first day of the week, John 20, verse 19, that the risen Lord Jesus stood in the midst of the assembly of the disciples in the upper room and he spoke peace to them as he continues to do by his word and spirit in the gospel to God's people who gather on the same day, even today. Even today. In Acts 20, verse 5 and 7, the Apostle Paul and the missionary team delayed their departure from Troas so they could meet with the church who were assembled to hear the word read, preached, prayed and sung on the first day of the week. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, the believers were instructed to set aside a portion for their income for the relief of the church on the first day of the week, on the day that the church gathered for worship. In Revelation 1, verse 10, John tells us that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. So the New Testament church, like God's people across the ages, kept one day in seven holy to the Lord for worship and assembly to hear his words. For they kept the first, not the seventh, as a Sabbath to the Lord our God. And I think there's something incredibly beautiful about that. There's something incredibly beautiful, something incredibly majestic. The first day, the first day of the week, followed by six days of work. Because that is the gospel pattern. We rest on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then resting on his work for us, we work for him. We rest on him and then we work for him. We rest, then we work. So the gospel pattern is that we rest on the first day and we live for God's praise in the days that follow. As an aside, the Hebrew literally says, Te di maya ton sabaton the one of the Sabbath, the one of the week. So the implication is that the New Testament writers always consciously reckon Sunday as Sabbath plus one, suggesting that the Sunday, the Lord's Day, is the Sabbath reborn, reborn, the first day after the Sabbath. 
And fourth, work and rest in light of new creation. What do we learn about the Sabbath in light of the world to come? Well, very simply, but very beautifully and very poignantly, the Lord's Day is a picture of the final rest, the wonderful rest we do not yet enjoy. The Lord's Day points us to that wonderful rest. Christ purchased for us the forgiveness of sin. We rest on him. We rest from dead works that we may serve the living and true God. We have the rest of peace with God by our Lord Jesus Christ. But we know, don't we, that that rest is not yet complete. Sin remains a deadly enemy and a constant factor in our lives. Suffering, sorrow, sickness, death interrupt our lives and shatter our rest. We're longing for that final Sabbath yet to come when all things are made new. A new heaven, a new earth, the home of righteousness. So we continue to observe the Sabbath as a way to say by a declaration of faith that this world is not our home, and we're looking for a city that is to come whose builder and maker is God. We're longing for that day when our earthly Sabbaths cease and give way to the unending Sabbath of eternal rest. I long for that day. In the presence of Jesus himself, which makes it the unending Sabbath. Creation, full, redemption, new creation. So we're called, we're called to cherish and prize the Sabbath and use it for the good of our souls. But the real objection that most of us have to the Sabbath is not that we can't find a biblical warrant for it. I'm sure you're all saying amen. It's rather we don't want to obey it. We would prefer that it didn't say what it says. To set apart one day out of seven for worship, we think, restricts our pleasure, impairs our enjoyment. Listen to the way C.S. Lewis deals with that objection. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures falling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We think the Sabbath will limit our joy because we'll get, have to give things up to keep it, when in fact it is a, gives us deeper joy than earthly pleasure affords. And that is the message of one of the key texts of the Sabbath from Isaiah 58, verse 13. If you turn your foot back, your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honourable. If you honour it, go not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. There is a deeper pleasure. There is a higher joy available than the distraction of shopping or the thrill of sport can ever afford. C.S. <coughs> Lewis was right. We're so far too easily pleased. And we settle for those mud pies in the slum. Pursuing our pleasure, our entertainment, we want to be distracted, we want to be busy because we think that if we keep the Sabbath it will steal our joy when in fact the Sabbath will maximise our joy. We don't need mud pies in the slum, my friend. There's the offer of a holiday at sea. There is delight, the prophet says in the Lord. Call the Sabbath a delight. Look forward to the Sabbath. Delight in the Lord. Exchange the lesser pleasure for the greater joy. 
How do you keep the Sabbath holy? I want to be very careful. I could say an awful lot, but I don't want to bind consciences or restrict Christian liberty or make absolute laws. But let me offer three simple, practical suggestions for a joyful Sabbath observance that I hope will be a blessing to you, and then we're done. John Calvin said, There is no doubt that by the Lord Jesus coming, the ceremonial part of this commandment was abolished. Christians ought therefore to shun completely the superstitious observance of days. And he, he then argued that the Lord's Day was instituted as a substitute for the Sabbath, and he sees three abiding principles on the Lord's Day inherited from the Jewish Sabbath. Number one, the first Sabbath principle is that it is fitting for one day in seven to be appointed as a day set aside for worship. We see from the beginning of creation this principle, one day in seven, reinforced by Moses, reappropriated in the New Testament, the Lord's Day. There is a sense that the discipline of corporate worship is more important than the discipline of private worship. I'm not saying that the other is not important. But do you feel the need to celebrate the Lord's resurrection with your brothers and sisters? Do you feel the need to? Now, if you say, well, I'm here, aren't I? And I'm going to come back this afternoon. Wow! I've got this one. I've got this. It's the other people I look down upon who don't do it. But I am so good because I'm there all the time. Think about your attitude. Think about your heart. Do we think of Sunday as climax or collapse? Saturday is the day we love. Saturday is good. You get stuff done in the garden. You can stay out late. Saturdays are fun. And Sunday we kind of crash our way through. And then it's Monday. How do you prepare for Sunday on Saturday? Question. Okay, I'm going to ask myself a question now. Is it wrong to watch football on a Sunday? I don't think you can say that from Romans 14 or Colossians 2. But is it wrong to make the focal point of Resurrection Sunday watching football? Yes, it is. So I'm not binding consciences at all. But what is, your, what is your main priority? What is your focal point? Because it's wrong to, you know, to get legalistic and look down your nose at people who don't do it the way you do it as well. That's wrong. But without laying down the law that Paul forbids us, I think it's within the parameters of Holy Scripture to exhort you to think about what example you set for your children with regards to the Lord's Day and to worship. Is there a more important habit that you can give your children than to go to church on Sunday? Because Sunday is the day that the Lord has given you to attend to your soul. So the best thing you can do for your family is to teach the importance of Lord's Day worship Sunday after Sunday. And there's a sense with coming back to worship the second time on the Lord's Day is bookending your day with worship is a good thing to do because otherwise the temptation is to get church done and then go and do the rest of your stuff for the rest of the day but you come back because you bookend your day with the worship of almighty God secondly we trust in Christ enough to stop one day in seven and rest we trust him enough to stop the Sabbath was meant to be a day of gladness not of gloom now, we may not have always treated it as such. It's not the invention of modern people, but even in the Old Testament, God's people grumbled about this day. Amos 8 verse 5, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? You can hear the old grumbling coming out, can't you? And the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances. John Owen said a man can scarcely in six days read over all the duties that are proposed to be observed on the seventh. And we try and set aside those certain rules and make it a day of rest. This is the day that God has set aside for rest. 
This is the day that we get to, not have to. This is the day that was meant for our goods. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath, if it has been crucified in Christ, the Lord's day, like John Calvin said, has come out of the grave and is meant to be a blessing. But we're told not to judge one another on the observance of days. That's what it says. But if God has hardwired us to need rest as part of the creation principle, then ultimately we're hurting ourselves. Is there anyone here who feels that life is underwhelming, like life is not busy, who wishes their days could be crowded with more things to do? Then give yourself a day that God has given to us to say no to the oughts in your head. Permission to ignore the things you must do and say that the other six days have no claim on this one. The other six have no claim on this one. Sabbath is the ceasing day, the stopping day. What does that mean? Well, if you've got a desk job, resting might mean to get on your bike, literally. Or go for a walk. Go for a run. Don't check email. What good news! James said, don't check your email. You've got my permission to quote you me on that. But what good news to a people who've been enslaved in four centuries when God said, I'm giving you one day in seven to take a break. One day in seven to take a break. What a gift. What a gift. So embrace what gives life. Not just recreation, but think about that word, recreation. What brings newness? Recreating. So let us not approach Sunday in an effort to get away with as much as possible, which is to look at it as a Jewish feast, but instead think, what blessing does God give me and my family as we celebrate the Lord's Day? And I can assure you that you have children to get ready, and if you've got naps to organise, and you've got food to prepare, there's plenty of works of necessity anyways. And make sure it's not only the wife who works hard while you put your feet up snoozing and snoring. But let's not approach not with the spirit of what can I or what can I not do, but what, does, what blessing does God mean to give me as I rest and worship? Reaching Sunday not as the day of collapse, but as the day of climax. If you think Saturday is the day when you can just stay up all hours and then go, 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 and on Sunday you kind of stumble and sleep your way through worship, that's not keeping the Lord's day as we ought. But of the three Sabbath principles that remain, the last one is the most explicit and the most important. Cease from your works and rest in Christ. Cease from your works and rest in Christ. John Calvin said it's the most important way to obey the fourth commandment, and he is dead right. Hebrews 4 verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. God always offered his people rest at creation, in the wilderness, in Joshua's day, in David's day, and today. And our chief rest is to cease from sin and to rest in Christ, who is greater than Moses. Jesus had the fourth commandment in his mind when he said, Come to me, all ye who are labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do we still need to obey the fourth commandment? Yes. Because Jesus said he did not come to abolish one jot or tittle of the law, but to fulfil it. And as Jesus fulfils it, he transforms it. And the shadow gives way to substance. And the shadow of the Mosaic law points us in the direction of trust. That was the lesson learned with the manna. You had enough on the sixth for two. 
so don't go out on the Sabbath. And now that Christ is here, Christ has come, the substance has come, so do we trust Christ solely for our salvation? Do we keep the fourth commandment? Yes, we do. And what is the most important way that we keep it? By ceasing from sinful strivings and resting in Christ for salvation. We cease from our sinful strivings and we rest in Christ for our salvation. Do you notice the strange language in, he in Hebrews? Let us therefore strive to enter the rest so no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So you have to strive to rest. You have to strive to put to death the deeds of the flesh. You have to strive to trust God enough. Not rely on your own efforts, but his alone. We have to strive to rest. We have to fight against the disobedience of unbelief, which means that we have to fight to rest. Because it's almost easier to go with the flow and do the same as everyone else. It's harder to stop. You see why the principle all along with the Sabbath was, do you trust the Lord? Do you trust the Lord? Anyone can keep going. But when God said to Israel, on that day, I do not want you to go out. I want you to trust. I want you to trust that I know how to take care of you. Do you trust God enough that he will take care of you? Do you trust him enough for your salvation, your eternity and your life? I want you to trust that if you set aside one day out of seven for worship and for rest, it will be for your blessing. He gave the gift as a blessing, not as a curse. Sabbath rest is about making Jesus Christ the centre of who we are. It's ceasing to find approval with the world and righteousness in our deeds. It means that we stop doubting God's promises and we trust that spiritual vitality is found only in trusting him enough to rest. Psalm 62, for God alone my soul waits in silence, from him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be greatly shaken. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, my hope is from him. Perhaps the Lord's day is the means of grace that you've been missing in your life. To find the rest which you have not found, that you keep looking for, or perhaps that you've forgotten. Some of us never stop. We never stop. I'm, and I had to preach this to myself, I assure you. Never stop working. Never stop playing. Never stop cleaning. Never stop planning. Never stop plotting. Never stop fretting. Never stop fussing. Never stop worrying. I know we profess the right thing. We're not in the good of what it means to rest in Christ. You don't have to earn anything. You don't have to prove anything. The world does not depend on you. Hallelujah. Even your family does not depend on you. Your salvation does not depend on you. Can you hear in the fourth commandment after we scrape away some of the traditions and some of the guilt, can you hear the voice of Jesus say, come unto me, all ye who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fourth commandment. We thank you for the Lord's day. We thank you for the day that Jesus arose in victory, in which he promises to meet with his people in the preaching of the word. And I ask, O oh Lord, that you'd give us such an appetite, such a hunger, that would squeeze every moment from this day for the blessing and nourishment of our souls. We ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen.